I'm here in the University of Houston, uh, where just a few yards away, uh, currently the Green Party is having a roll call. Uh, soon, Jill Stein will receive the nomination, uh, as will her running mate, Ajamu Baraka. But in the meantime, I'm here with David Cobb. David Cobb is the engagement and outreach uh, director for Move to Amend. Thanks for joining us, David. Thank you, Donna. It's a pleasure to be here with the Real News Network, where, you know, actual news gets described. Uh, so, David, tell me a bit about your, uh, your journey with Move to Amend and what your role is here, um, what your role has been uh, with the Green Party, um, and what, what your sort of response is to specifically Dr. Stein's endorsement of Move to Amend. Well, Darna, Move to Amend is a multiracial, multiethnic coalition of groups and individuals from across the country who are calling for a constitutional amendment to abolish in its entirety the illegitimate, court-created, totally made-up idea that a corporation must be treated as if it's a person under law with inherent and alienable constitutional rights. And also the equally odious, also court-created idea that money is First Amendment protected political speech. See, these two doctrines are not just individual court decisions. They're not just individual laws. They're core doctrines that have allowed the ruling elite to steal our sacred right to self-government. And as a lawyer, what just fills me with righteous indignation is that they're using the legal system to legalize the theft. Well, we at Move to Men say, ya basta, enough already. We don't actually have to accept this because you see, if a corporation is a person with constitutional rights, it means corporate lawyers can go into court and overturn environmental protection laws, worker safety laws, public health laws, and campaign finance laws. It literally means that we the people can't govern ourselves. So. I was one of the 12 people in the living room that founded this organization. Now, we weren't just 12 yahoos, right? I mean, well, maybe we were yahoos, but we weren't just any yahoos. We were 12 people who worked with the Alliance for Democracy, Reclaim Democracy, Democracy Unlimited, the Program on Demo uh, Corporations Law and Democracy, the Center for Media and Democracy. Getting anything in common here? All these democracy organizations saw the Citizens United case for the assault that it really was. So we gathered together before the decision came down and said, can we try to launch an affirmative, positive movement for democracy as a constitutional amendment campaign? Darna, today we're 408,000 people. 408,000 people participating, and we've helped 17 states call for a constitutional amendment, and we've had over 600 communities pass resolutions of support at the city council or county commissioner level. But my favorite objective number that I want to share with you and the Real News viewership, we put this issue on the ballot in 350 communities. That's where ordinary citizens can actually vote on whether they support the abolition of corporate constitutional rights and money as speech. Darna, we've been on 350 ballots. I want you to guess how many we've won. Tell me. The answer, 350. We haven't lost yet. I mean, and yes, that includes San Francisco and Boston and Madison, you know, the liberal places. You know where else we won? Salt Lake City, Utah. We won in Waukesha, Wisconsin, the hometown of Republican Tea Party Governor Scott Walker. Y'all, they haven't voted for a uh, Democrat for president or Congress in 40 years in Waukesha. Move to Men was on the ballot there, and we won 70% of the vote. Move to Men was on the ballot in Montana. Yes, that Montana. One of the most politically, culturally conservative states in the union. Move to Men was on the ballot. We won 74% of the vote. Here's the point I'm making. Whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, a Green, a Libertarian, an Independent, a Conservative, a Moderate, a Liberal, there is almost universal support for the Move to Amend campaign. Here's the second point I want to make. Move to Amend is an unequivocal progressive organization. We are anti-racist. We are feminist. We have a set of principles around social justice, and we talk about those issues internally. We are building a progressive organization. We are one of the few organizations, however, that say we're building a progressive organization and we will relate authentically to conservatives. And it's working. Not only are we winning at the ballot box in conservative places, I want to share a quick story. I was in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska uh, on the border of Iowa gave my basic presentation, talked about white supremacy, empire, patriarchy, 
corporate power, but I also talked about the proper role of the corporation and how the founder's original intent was to properly control them through the chartering process. I talked about judicial activism and sovereignty. A man at the back stood up and he said, this is, like, I'm completely with you on this amendment language, but you got to stop talking about that left-wing jargon stuff. Like, I, millions of Republicans like me will join you if you'll just give that up. Darna, I said, I can't give that up because that's who I am. But if you're sincere and you want to work with me on the amendment language, can we agree that we have disagreements on policy proposals, but an agreement on that amendment language? Can we authentically work together? He said, yes, that was two years ago. Two months ago, the Potawatomi County Republican Party in Iowa didn't just pass a resolution in support of Move to Mend. Potawatomi County Republican Party amended their party platform to adopt this principle. They don't agree with us at Move to Men on most of our policy positions, but at the end of the day, they agree on that principle and we've made alignment. The second part that I want to circle back to is you asked me about Jill Stein. Move to Men is a 501c4 organization. We don't endorse candidates at all. We do, however, put out candidate questionnaires. We do invite candidates to reflect on us and to endorse us or to otherwise take a position uh, on our proposed amendment. I can tell you that Jill Stein so far is the only presidential candidate who has unequivocally endorsed the We the People Amendment, has unequivocally uh, endorsed the concept of a constitutional amendment to abolish corporate constitutional rights and money as speech. And we welcome that endorsement and we challenge Donald Trump, Gary Johnson and Hillary Clinton to take the same position. Now, it's interesting, actually, that you've mentioned that she is the only candidate uh, who has actually endorsed uh, Move to Amend. Considering that in this uh, election cycle specifically, we've seen so much bipartisan support of the kind you're talking about uh, against money in politics. Um, but, you know, when some people speak about, uh, you know, the the widespread support for uh, candidates like Donald Trump, they speak mostly to, you know, how how Trump gets to the soul of uh, the white working class, the xenophobic and racist soul. In reality, it seems that many people are also supporting him, not that he isn't like a racist and xenophobic, but they're also supporting him because of his uh, appeal to uh, populist economics in a way. Um, is there anything that the Green Party can do or that this convention can do to sort of boost that support and raise up the message of Move to Amend, not only amongst progressive voters as those who are traditionally in the Green Party, but also, as you're saying, amongst conservatives? I, I think that's right, and it's a good question, Darden, and I want to remind, look, I'm actually, I grew up in poverty, right? I didn't, I'm not just working class. I literally grew up in a house without a flush toilet. I used to be ashamed and embarrassed about that. I've learned because I've done the work around understanding capitalism and racism and white supremacy and patriarchy. The culture tries to shame us for these sorts of things. I'm a good person, right? Uh, I always understood the economic uh, system was exploitive and oppressive. Because I've done the work around race and gender, I've also come to understand this system is also patriarchal, this system is also premised upon white supremacy, and I've just learned to have honest conversation about those things. Uh, and so, you know, to me, it, it's not that it's casual, it's that we have to talk about reality. And as a poor white person, what I know is this, the boss man has had his boot on our neck from jump. And the, the rich and the powerful have, had to sub, have, have worked hard to try to divide poor whites from poor black and brown and immigrant folk, right? Uh, if you don't know about Bacon's Rebellion, by the way, do a little research and take a look at what it looks like uh, when there is genuine solidarity across this construct known as race uh, uh, based on the idea of actual liberation. But here's the thing. I would submit this to you. If we want to talk about actual economic populism, let's talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Let's talk about the fact that the Green Party is the only political party whose presidential nominee is unequivocally opposed to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I mean, the reality is the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are both in support of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and Gary Johnson, the Libertarian Party candidate, who I like on a lot of issues, is wrong on this one. I think the Trans-Pacific Partnership is one of those ways that we in the Green Party can bring together environmentalist, uh, uh, trade unionist and organized labor and ordinary working class folk to talk about the need for a Green New Deal. What we need to do is actually invest 
billions of dollars in infrastructure projects, roads, bridges, a train system for interstate uh, travel in this country, uh, a transition away from coal and oil and nuclear power to sustainable alternative energy sources. You know, the reality is we could, ha we could cancel student debt, we could have free universal health care, we could have free college education all the way up through the university level and still have plenty of money to spare if we just tax the billionaires. Uh what you're saying actually is uh, something that in a lot of ways was voiced by Bernie Sanders. Um, when The Real News interviewed uh, Bernie Sanders back in April, actually, um, he was asked if he would support uh, an FDR-style public jobs program. He said that that would be on the table with him as a candidate. Um, how has the Sanders campaign actually sort of raised up I, the, some of the ideas that are in uh, the fight to end Citizens United, some of the, the fights that uh, Move to Amend has been taking up? So Darna, I appreciate the question, and I also want to start by lifting up Bernie Sanders. The reality is that Bernie Sanders did not create this moment or this movement, but he did galvanize it. Uh, he spoke to the best of us, the aspirations and the hopes that so many of us had. Bernie Sanders called for a political revolution. Let's be clear, a real political revolution cannot be run are you in in just one election cycle? A real political revolution cannot be won, W-O-N, by just one candidate, no matter how great he or she is. A real political revolution requires sustained effort over time, a set of principles and values, a program for how to challenge, contest, and take state power, how to exercise that power in a democratic fashion. I submit to you that Move to Amend is a sustained effort to amend the United States Constitution to peacefully, nonviolently waive revolution as a concrete campaign for a constitutional amendment. I submit to you that the Green Party, as, an, uh, as a political party, is a way for people to do the same thing at the local, county, state, and federal level at the ballot box. And at the end of the day, I don't care, frankly, uh, what, what the name of a political party is. I do know this. Social change requires social movements, broad, deep, conscious, militant social movements that are educated, agitated, and organizing for real change and an electoral expression at the ballot box so that you can actually codify the, the social change that you make in the hearts and minds and turn it into legislation and law. So I just want to remind viewers of the real news that what it took alternative political parties to win at the ballot box. The abolition of slavery, women getting the right to vote, the creation of the Social Security Administration, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation laws, pure food and drug laws, ending child labor, the direct election of the United States Senate, Folks, the entire fabric of what we today consider the bare damn minimum for a just and compassionate society, that fabric, that tapestry was woven together thread by thread, issue by issue, campaign by campaign by alternative political parties. Alternative political parties who did their work when they were called dangerous and Americans, who did their work when they were called uh, radicals, who did their work when they were called naive and unrealistic and who did their work when they were called spoilers. So my submission is this. We have got to have the same courage that those other movements had to build a movement and build political parties and make political demands that are independent of the ruling class, independent of the oligarchs who have taken control of both parties. Uh, now, as you said, uh, the, the role of uh, alternative parties is important which is, and that's true whether or not uh, we actually have a, d a direct win. Um, what does success look like in this campaign uh, season, in this election season for the Green Party, knowing that it's very unlikely that Jill Stein could actually take the presidential win? First of all, I gotta tell you this, if Jill Stein and Gary Johnson were able to debate on the stage with Donald Trump and uh, Hillary Rodden Clinton, I think that, that we, we would be having a different conversation. Let's just acknowledge that. Let's also acknowledge that that debate stage is actually controlled by the Commission on Presidential Debates, which is a merger of the Democratic National Committee and the Republican National Committee. They literally uh, took that away from the League of Women Voters, or rather the League of Women Voters refused to go along with a sham on the American people. 
but your point is well taken. Uh, the, the, what does a win look like? What I would say is this. From my perspective, Darden, a win looks like building a movement for peace, justice, democracy, ecological sustainability, a movement that is taking itself seriously about understanding the crisis that we are in, ecological, political, economic crisis. Systems failure is happening now. And we need to, from the bottom up, at the local, county, state level, be building the movement necessary in order to actually be able to govern ourselves. So to me, you know, I don't measure success or failure at one election cycle over the other. I actually measure our success with whether or not we are actually advancing our understanding of the world and are developing and implementing strategic plans for how we will actually govern ourselves and how we will create not just a progressive world, but you know what? I don't want to just talk about single payer health care and, uh, and abolishing the prison industrial complex. I, mean, I can go down the list of the Green Party positions, platforms and program. I'm very proud of them. But I also want to say this. Don't we want to live in a society, in a country where love and compassion and tolerance and, and, and acceptance and cooperation is integrated into our political discourse? That's how I would uh, measure success. Are we bringing love, compassion, and joy into the political process and into one another's lives? Uh, and do you see progress on this front? I mean, in terms of rhetoric, we've seen uh, so much rhetoric, uh, as I said before, rhetoric uh, from both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump ab about popular economics, populist economics, um, of which, you know, often the, the, meat, the meat is actually quite questionable, uh, but the rhetoric is there. Um, we hear candidates like Hillary Clinton speak about systemic racism, the end for systemic racism, when we know that she was actually in support of the crime bill, which uh, had its own impact on, you know, uh, black people across America. Um, Donald Trump has spoken about unity uh, for all people while also calling for mass deportations. Um, has this rhetoric uh, in all of these fights uh, for, uh, as you're saying, for justice for all people, but then also in, uh, specifically uh, in the end uh, of money in politics, has this rhetoric built up the movement or has it in some way uh, posed a challenge as it's been co-opted? So the answer, yes. And I don't mean to be coy, but I mean, the way you phrased the question, Let's acknowledge the fact that this rhetoric is being used by the corporatist parties is an example of the fact that it works, right? So there is a narrative that they are now having to begin to reflect. Now you and I both know and l viewers of The Real News know that the rhetoric is not being matched by policy proposals from either the Democratic or the Republican Party, but the fact that they feel obliged to talk about it is actually an indication that we're shifting the political discourse and the conversation. So let's just acknowledge that. Let's also acknowledge that at the end of the day, the, that regardless of who is president of the United States, the polarization in this country is going to continue. I genuinely believe that we are entering into a moment where something new is going to be created, right? Uh, I want that something new to be something that is actually dismantling white supremacy and empire and capitalism and, and homophobia and creating in its place loving, compassionate uh, institutions that actually work for one another and are ecologically sustainable for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren. So here's the thing. If we actually believe that that is the world that we want, we need to start creating it. So I am a believer in saying we have to fight harm, abuse, and exploitation and oppression wherever it manifests. So we fight against the bad stuff. But you know what else we have to do? We have to create the good stuff. We have to create a cooperative economic uh, economy. The Solidarity Economy Network, the Next Systems Project, Cooperation Jackson. We could spend an entire program on all the amazing new economy uh, efforts that are springing up. I know because I've seen much of it covered on the real news. There is an amazing new process of new institutions being created as we go along. But here's the thing. If you just create new institutions within the existing system, it will always only be a niche or an alternative. What if we actually fought the harm and abuse where it, where it existed? We created alternative institutions. 
and we built political power to shift the entire culture and the framework of power itself so that we learned it's not power over, but it's power with, that we actually took transparency and democracy seriously and we're in, going to engage in that process, then, Darden, I think that what we would see is genuine, nonviolent, revolutionary cultural work that would begin to manifest not only at the ballot box, but in our consumer choices. It would manifest in how we treat each other on the day to day in every way. How we live, work, and play would be different. That's how I would garner success. Now, can you, uh, just to, to wrap up, can you speak a bit about how um, corporate interest in, uh, in politics, and specifically how uh, so-called big money in politics um, intersects with uh, some of the other issues we've been talking about, intersects with, um, for instance, systemic racism uh, or uh, justice for uh, people of color, for immigrants across America, uh, for, a number of the, uh, for gender justice, uh, for a number of these other issues that we've touched upon here. Darden, we have to be clear about something. The large transnational corporation today are not just exercising power. They are ruling us. As surely as masters once ruled slaves, as surely as kings once ruled subjects, unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are ruling over us because they're making the decisions. A small wealthy elite have literally taken control of this country. It is an oligarchy, a plutocracy. They use the transnational corporation as a tool to exert that power and control. But as a lawyer, what I can tell you is this. Corporations are just tools created under the political process. They are not persons with inherent rights. They're just tools. And like any tool, they can be put to productive, legitimate use, or they can be put to destructive use. What we're seeing with corporate rule today is the horrors of the prison industrial complex, the horrors of immigration policy, where literally, literally state governments are contracting with private corporations to guarantee a certain number of beds in both the criminal system and the deportation facilities, right? So we are incentivizing all of the worst things that we could possibly be doing and creating a profit motive around it. This is insane. This is crazy. So I submit this. You can't name a social problem or ill or, or issue that I can't within two to three steps, if not one step, take it directly to corporate power, directly to corporate constitutional rights, directly to money in elections. The last thing I want to do is cover this notion around specifically money in elections. We have turned elections into auctions in this country where 158 families are funding almost all of the candidates for both major political parties, 158 families. This is outrageous. And so I, I'm going to conclude this conversation to ask viewers of The Real News, whether you agree or disagree uh, with everything else that you've heard from us, please go to the website. And if, if Cameron is really good, maybe right about now it says www.movetomen.org. But go to that website and just learn about what we're up to. Learn about the incredible growth that we've experienced because we're willing to tell the truth to people and people are responding accordingly. No matter which one of the elites ends up ruling us uh, for the coming four years, uh, we hope to follow up with you and see how the election cycle is treating Move to Amend uh, and what your next steps are. So thanks for joining us, David. Thank you. And I do want to say once again uh, how grateful I am not only for this conversation, but for the real news itself. Because what we know is the corporate, traditional corporate media is actually lying to us. Thanks to WikiLeaks, it's actually being demonstrated. The real news is more necessary than ever today. Again, I don't always agree with everything I watch on the real news, but what I appreciate is I actually see journalism on the real news. I see investigative reporting on the real news. I see conversation that is not allowed to happen in the corporate media. So thank you for what you do. If you agree with David, we're in the middle of a fundraiser on the realnewsnetwork.com. Uh, so somewhere around here is a button, a big red button that says donate. Feel free to drop us a few dollars so we can continue to do this. Uh, and stay tuned for more coverage from the Green Party here in Houston. Thanks so much for joining us.